Christopher Cantwell and Lan Medina make Tony face the consequences of his actions as Hellcat enters the God's Mine to find the man she once loved. Christopher Cantwell takes us into the finale of his sprawling Korvac saga storyline with an issue that explores the coda of the entire series up until now in probably the most unique, original, and frankly genius way I have ever seen. Cantwell explores the idea that Tony Stark views himself as a sort of Jekyll and Hyde analogy, showcasing Tony desperately trying to find validation in his life in any way he can through his exploits as Iron Man and even how secret identities and alter egos can be viewed in this light as well. Cantwell also also brings back the idea that Tony is stuck in a rut and in a cycle, getting slightly meta with how and when a new writer tackles a character, they feel obligated to shake up the status quo, but it always ends up coming back to where it started when the run ends, and Tony finds himself sick of it all. It's such an engaging and interesting way to look at the character and easily puts this entire run in contention for the best Iron Man story ever written. Lan Medina tags in for Angel Unzueta and Ibrahim Robertson for another visually stunning issue that explores Tony's warped mind. Again, Medina joins a nice group of artists who really complement each other so damn well, never feeling too out of place with what has come before in previous issues. Iron Man issue 18 was another stunning character study from Chris Cantwell and his team, exploring Tony's need for validation and the world view he has on why he needs to be a hero, culminating in a story that will no doubt go down as one of the best Iron Man runs ever written. I'm going to give this issue a 10 out of 10. Iron Man issue 18 finds Tony in the aftermath of killing his friends, thinking about how his father once told him there is a thin line between enemy and friend, and you should always be ready to strike first if things change. He remembers how Howard told him that everyone is the same and every person wants more than they have, and there is always an anger inside if they don't get it, even in the gods. Hellcat confronts the being, telling him that he needs to talk with her. She touches him, using her powers to enter his mind, taking Tony to a vast wheat field. Tony wants to know where this is coming from in his mind deducing it is from a distant memory of his great-great-grandfather Isaac Stark's property, knowing that he used to work the fields as a boy. He knows that he used to go up there in the summers when his parents shipped him off there, but he still had his servants, toys, computers, and even his own boat. Tony knows that Isaac built the place in order for him to get out of the work he had to do. He knows that he killed his friends and that he can bring them back and even make it so they don't remember, but Patsy knows it did happen and Tony did this, and that's been the biggest problem for a while now, since he's operating as if there aren't any consequences to his actions. Tony says that he wanted to make things better, but Patsy reminds him they all want that, but Tony is aware he doesn't make it easy for his friends since there is always conflict or confrontation, and he makes them into his enemy. He knows that it's because they get in his way, or it just feels that way to him, and they are stopping him from doing what he needs to. Patsy asks what that is, and Tony tells her his friends stop him from being a hero and a friend, but Patsy knows that's a lie, so Tony says it's really because they stop him from being something other than worthless, knowing that if he isn't winning or being the absolute best to his father, he was invisible. Patsy says that her mother preferred the idealized version of herself as well, remembering how she would write stories about her when she was a charming, beautiful student with perfect grades, while the real Patsy was in the yellow room, waiting to see if her mother would look up from the version of her that she created in her head. She knows it's no wonder she married a demon, as Tony knows that she became a hero since she she wasn't good enough and needed to be something even better. Patsy thinks so, but isn't really sure why she chose to do it. Tony asks if she's heard of the story of Jekyll and Hyde, and Patsy knows it all too well, but Tony knows her that the good and the bad side of the man isn't the real story, revealing Jekyll is a good person and he's smart and dutiful, but he has flaws like everyone and starts wondering if he should rid himself of his lesser qualities, since he can't stand them and deep down he hates the weaker parts of himself so he concocts a unique method, something that will allow him to be the paragon he always wanted to be. Tony knows that Jekyll can be perfect now now with no distractions or errors, but the bad, selfish and ugly stuff is still there, but it's now a separate self, a self that he doesn't really think about or even care about, since he gets to be a saint now, just like he secretly wanted. Tony knows though that Jekyll isn't some saint, he's just a misguided person and he continues to do bad things and his flaws remain and people get hurt because of them. He knows that the grand transformation begins losing its effectiveness and he tries drinking more of the potion that made it work the first time, but it 
it doesn't this time, and the floors grow into abscesses, but the man keeps reaching, even as the perfect he wants keeps slipping away further and further, and eventually he goes for broke, but it just keeps getting worse and it repeats itself. Tony tells Patsy that he is stuck in his ways as the woman tells him to bring back his friends and make them remember what he did to them, so Tony won't forget either. Tony agrees, resurrecting everyone he killed and apologising to them profusely. He tells them that he's done with the power cosmic, reverting everyone in New York back to how they were before, before erasing the power from himself completely. Patsy thinks that he could have fixed her courtyard first, but Tony knows he'll fix that with his own two hands, but Patsy thinks he shouldn't come round for a while. Tony takes his leave, apologising again for everything as he takes a walk through Central Park, remembering how his father used to walk the park to clear his head, but he used to do it with security who had taken over the entire park so no one could get in. He thinks about how there is always something they need to suit up with, be it money, iron or power, and he is tired of it all. As he heads under a darkened bridge, a man with a knife mugs him but Tony gives up his wallet, not wanting to try and fix the man or teach him a lesson or throw him in jail. He doesn't know if it's right as he falls down, feeling the effects of his morphine withdrawal take over. Cold sweats cover his body as Tony lays there dying, knowing no money or iron can stop this. He knows it's hard for him to make friends and even when he does, he soon turns them into enemies and while he can't explain it, he knows it's just easier for him to have an enemy than a friend. Suddenly, a very angry Korvac appears, telling him that he had a brilliant idea and wanted to share it with Tony first. He reveals that he killed the Living Tribunal and the Inbetweener since they would stop him from bringing Universal Harmony via Universal Annihilation, the perfect piece of silence. He reveals Tony will be the first recipient of this gift and he'll be the first death thrown onto the Great Pyre. Korvac stops himself though as he realises that thanks to the morphine withdrawal Tony is going through, Tony Stark has died. 